In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, it is you that we study. It is you that we wish to know, your Son, Jesus Christ. For as Pope Benedict XVI has said again and again, at the center of our faith is a person, Jesus Christ. We want to know you and serve you and love you. Help us to know you, especially in your word. For we believe that you are the word made flesh. Help us to be more like you in the world so that we can be, so that others can come to know you through us, our words and our actions. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. First, give me one minute or one and a half to recap what we've talked about so far in the Old Testament. Really quickly, one paragraph in each thing. The Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. You know this by now, it is the birth, the call, and the promise of the people of God, to the people of God. God selects a people to be his own. God equips them with the law and worship and gives them the promised land. All of this leads to the attempt to evoke a response from the people of God. God has presented his laws and decrees. Now it is up to us to respond. In the historical books, after the Pentateuch, we talked about how they are a continuation of the conquest of the Israelites and God's protection of them. It foreshadows and prophesies the spiritual conquest of the world through the church one day under the leadership of the Messiah. And wisdom, we talked about that last time, it is a shift in thinking, represents a shift in thinking about eternal life. It asks difficult questions about life, death, and God. And the ultimate lesson found in many of the books of wisdom is that suffering happens to us all. But the one who endures prevails in the end. We cannot understand God or the workings of the world, but we can endure all things through our trust and fidelity to God. And then the prophets. Mostly the prophets call the people to renounce sin and idolatry, to maintain God's law, and stay focused on God's promises. And so their writings consisted of warnings, threats, announcements of punishment, and promises of deliverance. Their prophecies came with solemnity and imaginative language. They were especially concerned with the coming of the Messiah in later years. So they urged people to be faithful to the covenant and wait for its fulfillment. So, the conclusion to the Old Testament, we learned about the origin of the Hebrew people, the call of God to be his special people, the giving of the law, the exhortation to be faithful and to return to the Lord, prophecies of the day of the Lord, and the new covenant. The stage is set then for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, everything points to him. So today now we come to the New Testament, first to the Gospels. We need to know that there really is only one Gospel. The Gospel means good news or glad tidings. It is God's announcement of salvation. That's really what Gospel is all about. The word Gospel is rooted in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings glad tidings, announcing peace, bearing good news, announcing salvation. So there in Isaiah, glad tidings or good news, that's really the gospel. Also in 61, 1, in that famous passage, which Jesus himself read in the synagogue and attributed to himself, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me he has sent me to bring glad tidings, etc. Glad tidings, gospel. That's really what it is. There's only one announcement, one gospel. It is Jesus Christ who came to give us that. Paul used the word gospel when he talked about a message and messages from God. So in other words, gospel was used to designate that announcement, that message, the story. And Mark was the first to use the word gospel to describe his book, or a book, telling the story about Jesus. In Mark 1, it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you notice that gospel in that, in Mark's gospel, the word gospel is a small g. He's not calling his book a gospel as much as he is saying the beginning of the announcement.
announcement, the good news, the glad tidings of Jesus Christ to the world. The first three Gospels that we have in the Bible are so similar that we call them the Synoptic Gospels. Now, I'm not um, a scholar, too. I'm not a great scholar of words and the origin of words, but I do know that sin, that's why I am, is same or similar, right? Like a synonym or something like that. And optic, obviously, to see or lens through which we see things. So it's synoptic is basically to see similarly or to see together. The authors of these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, often seem to have used the same sources and even each other's work in writing their Gospels. I shouldn't say often seem to have used, they did. I mean, word for word, as we'll see, they lifted large portions from Mark's Gospel, especially Luke and Matthew, and another source as well. I guess they weren't worried about plagiarism back then. And John's Gospel, of course, is unique. He uses more images and symbolism to teach about Jesus and his message. From the second century onward, it seems clear that the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were termed Gospels with a capital G. We have four Gospels in the Bible from the second century on. And the order, the order of putting them first in the New Testament is obviously purposeful. You know, the Gospels focus on Jesus. They tell the story of Jesus and they give us salvation in Jesus. It's not just like a book that we read. We get, we obtain, we participate, if you will, in salvation by knowing Jesus and by confessing Him as our Savior. We get that from the Gospels. And so it makes sense that you would start the New Testament with them, just as the Old Testament starts with the central part of that, the Pentateuch, or the Torah. So it makes sense. The, then we get the Acts of the Apostles, which tells of the early Christian response to the Gospel. And then we get Paul. The other letters, and finally, Revelation of John. It's surprising a little bit that Luke and Acts are separated because, as we'll see, they're really written by the same author, part one and part two of his work. So it's kind of surprising that they are separated. In between them is the Gospel of John. It also, the, 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 the putting the four Gospels first confuses it a little bit the timeline of the New Testament. We need to know and remember always that. Paul's letters were written first. They predate the Gospels. As we'll see, the Gospels were written maybe around 70 to 100, 105, or 110. Paul's letters were written earlier, maybe 20 years earlier than Mark's, the earliest Gospel to be written, around 50 to 60, maybe even a little bit later. But Paul's letters were written first, so it kind of confuses it a little bit. However, it still makes total sense to start with the Gospels, of course, and so the New Testament starts with them. Each writer, we have to know, each Gospel writer, each evangelist, had a different audience in mind. They had audiences with different ways of looking at things and different experiences. And so that helps to answer this question, how can they give different accounts of something so plain, something that people saw happen, you know, miracles or sayings of Jesus, how can they be so different? And granted, they don't contradict each other, that's for sure, but each one offers different insights and different aspects of an event. So today, you know, we're kind of, we're literalists, and we think, but why didn't they just tell the story? You know, just, if someone was there, how many loaves were used, were broken? You know, there's different accounts and different things. How many baskets were filled up after, you know, seven or 12, get your story straight. You know, but they weren't interested in exact details. That's not what the Gospel is all about. They wanted to get this news out as fast as possible. And they wanted to tailor it to their different audiences. That's why they focus on different things, as we'll see. An example might help. Um, this, this just occurred to me as I was thinking about this. Uh, last year, unfortunately, one of the banks near the school was robbed happened a couple of times. I think it happened three times last year. And this was in the spring, and every time that happens, of course, the police call the, the principal. We have a lockdown in the school and everything, just to make sure the kids are safe and everyone's safe over there. 
And this was the third one last year, I think, if you're watching this online. It's a safe and great school. Send your kids. But anyway, it's just part of, part of our neighborhood, part of where we live. Anyway, um, so I heard about this as I was walking in from a meeting. And so I headed over there because I like to go over there when that happens just to make sure everyone's okay and kind of calm everyone down. So I got into the family center where a lot of the kids were waiting. This was after school, by the way. They couldn't be released. They had to just all wait there. And I was mobbed by the kids, of course. That always happens anyway. But they all wanted to tell me the big news about the robbery. Now, granted, we didn't tell them. The principal didn't tell them what was happening. They just knew it was locked down. However, because of phones, you know, it was after school, so some could look at their phones or they could call their families. They heard about it, and the news just spread throughout the school. And so I wrote down a few of the responses and a few of the things the kids gave me. And it was really interesting because they were all experts, of course. Um, it lasted about a half hour, and then they went home. Okay, but during that time, here we go. So the littlest ones came up to me and said, we don't know why we couldn't go home, but our teacher said we had to lock the door and play some games. So we're doing that. So that's their take on it. The little ones, of course, which is appropriate. The older ones said, someone robbed a bank and we can't find it, so we have to stay inside. Okay? Others, this one girl says, all I know is I was getting ready to go home. Someone told us the bank was robbed. I told my friend Julie we should put everything away, so we did. We sat in the back of the classroom and played on her iPhone. <laughs> another was very succinct. This was another little one. The bank was robbed, we couldn't leave, and then they said it was okay. Still another gave a long description of what happened. And then, a few minutes later, as time went on, some of the kids said, well, I was upstairs and I looked out the window, and I saw a million cops all over our parking lot. There were two. And, uh, and somebody else said, and I think I saw someone with a gun. You know, I mean, it's just, that's just what happens, unfortunately. It's, it's sad that that's part of the kids' reality, but the point is, you know, they all had a story to tell, and, and it just, they told it as though it were gospel truth, if you will. I talked to the principal and the police right away, of course, and I found the story. There wasn't a gun, but they were looking for someone, you know, yes, the bank was robbed. So there was some truth in all of it. But anyway, it just kind of helps to remind us that even though here's something that definitely happened, and yet we've had 280 different stories from that. It's like, a little like the four Gospels. They want to tell the good news, each according to their particular milieu and to a certain audience. Okay, so they, they're just told in a different light, in a different way. Um, speaking of the Gospels, as we are, there's a great quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 124, which quotes Dave Erwin from Vatican II. The central object of the New Testament is Jesus Christ, God's incarnate Son. His acts, teachings, passion, and glorification, and His Church's beginnings under the Spirit's guidance. The central aspect of the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Just like Pope Benedict keeps saying, the central aspect of our faith is a person, Jesus Christ. Also from the Catechism, the next paragraph, 125. The Gospels are the heart of all scriptures because they are our principal source for the life and teaching of the Incarnate Word, our Savior. And then I re-quoted re -quote, re on your handout the quote that I just love from St. Therese of Lisieux. I love her and, and, and all of her writings, but this is just so good. She's so human and so emotional and passionate. She just writes, Above all, it's the Gospels that occupy my mind when I'm at prayer. My poor soul has many needs, and yet this is the one thing needful. I'm always finding fresh lights there, hidden and enthralling meanings. I say to that, amen, sister, me too. So that's kind of what I want to pass on to you, these new insights and fresh meanings. First, Matthew. Matthew is listed as the first gospel because it was thought for centuries that it was the first one to be written. As well, Matthew's gospel obviously held, was held in high esteem among our ancestors in the early church. It is the most quoted gospel among early Christian writers. Like who? The patristics, like St. Ignatius of Antioch, our Ignatius, 
or St. Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, and others. When they quoted the, the Gospels, a lot of times, most of the time, they quoted Matthew's Gospel. So it obviously shows you that they, it held a, a, a high, it was held in high esteem. Nowadays, the vast majority of Christian scholars believe that it was not the first Gospel written, but we'll look at that in a little bit. Matthew was most concerned with righteousness, and, and I got a lot of this um, from the introductions to the Gospels, and you can read those over in the New American Bible especially. But Matthew was most concerned with what, he, what we call righteousness, and that is just the faithful response to God's Gospel, the faithful, the faithful way of living, of, of orienting our lives as a response to the Gospel. That's what Matthew was most concerned with. He wanted us to be righteous. Okay. The passion and the resurrection for, for Matthew and for all of us supremely exemplifies righteousness for Matthew. And here's the quote. In Jesus' absolute faithfulness to the Father's will that he drank the cup of suffering, the incomparable model for Christian obedience is given. In his death for the forgiveness of sins, the saving power of God is manifested as never before. So Matthew wanted to get the word out, and he certainly did, especially the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and get us to follow. We can follow Jesus through suffering death to the glory of the resurrection. Matthew was writing primarily for a Jewish Christian audience. We know that because there are a lot of references to Jewish customs, liturgies, practices, words, and beliefs. And this quote says, the Church of Matthew, originally strongly Jewish Christian, had become one in which Gentile Christians were predominant. So Matthew was writing to this community to try to get them to accept the gospel, to be righteous and to live righteous lives. But it's pretty clear already by the time of the writing that a lot of the Jewish people were not accepting it, as the Gentiles were. And so, as, the, as it goes on, we just know that more and more Gentile Christians, Greek-speaking Christians, had started to accept his gospel than his own people. It begins with a genealogy, which makes sense. Remember that? We read it actually, I believe, at midnight mass, and then one other time on Advent. It says, the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father, was the father, was the father, it goes on and on, remember that? And a lot of times a deacon or a priest who's reading it, like myself, just trips over these names. Abiathar, uh, I'm trying to think of all of the names, but Zerubbabel, there's some great names in there, some that uh, are not easy to say, and I'm sure we all just say the wrong names or the wrong pronunciations. But, but Matthew wanted to, to root Jesus in, in Jewish history, so that's why he did it. He wants to tell us he came as one of us, a human being. He's also different from us, so he includes the virgin birth. But he came as one of us, rooted in Jewish history. So, he, and, and what's interesting is he starts with David. The first thing he says is the story of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Instead of saying son of Abraham, it's interesting. But that's because he wanted to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy given to David. One day your descendant, I will raise up from your descendants a king whose reign will never end. That's Jesus. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the son of David and the promised Messiah. Matthew wants to make it clear, especially to Jewish Christians, that it's all been pointing to this event, and here he is now in a moment in history. Jesus personifies for Matthew Israel's experience in the Old Testament. Remember, we said it again and again, I just said it at the beginning today, that it describes the origin of the people, how they were called out of Egypt, how they were persecuted and given the promise of the promised land. Jesus as well, born, called by God. He was called out of Egypt. In Matthew's Gospel, he has him going to Egypt. Remember, Joseph revealed, receives a dream, take the child and his mother to Egypt, for Herod is trying to kill him. And then, years later, now, the one who wanted to kill him is dead, come back to Israel. So he was called out of Egypt like our ancestors. He was persecuted and given the promise. Rather, he gave us the promise of eternal life. 
Even though he's writing to a mostly Jewish Christian audience, he knew the Gentiles had accepted the good news, while his own people had not. Therefore, he includes the story about the Magi, which is Gentiles, people from far off lands, who came and did homage to Jesus, even while his own people were unaware or rejected him. Scholars will tell us that there are five great books, if you will, to Matthew. It's clear that there's, he, he kind of broke it up into these discourses or teaching blocks of Jesus. There are five of them. I wonder where that would come from. Five books, five books. Oh yeah, the Torah, the Pentateuch. There it is again. You know, five books of the Psalms, five books in Matthew. Now, it, you may not be able to see this just by reading it, but a lot of scholars have pointed it out in the New American Bible and in others. And each one concludes with words like this, when Jesus finished these words, blah, blah. So you can tell, he tells me, like the Sermon on the Mount is one long discourse. When Jesus finished these words, they went to Bethany. Then, blah, and anyway, another one, and another one. Okay. Matthew's Gospel is very organized. No other evangelist puts as much work on style and order as Matthew. And I just told you, like, there's five books, five... He, he groups Jesus' teachings all together and kind of, kind of uh, does that for his whole Gospel. In a Passion account, Matthew talks about Jesus' obedience and the obedience to his destiny. He is the fulfillment of prophecy, but he also had fear. He was afraid. He prayed that God would take his cup away from him. Matthew's trying to connect with us, saying, you know, yes, he's the Son of God, the Messiah, but he's one of us. He was afraid. He prayed to God for strength, and he was obedient. You can do the same, basically. In the resurrection, for Matthew, as well as for all of us, a new age has dawned now. We're in a new, totally new stage in our history. And he wants to show that by giving us apocalyptic signs accompanying Jesus' death and resurrection. So there's the great earthquake when he dies, right? And the, the temple curtain is torn in two. And at the resurrection, there's angels there, you know, speaking to Mary Magdalene and the others. He wants to show us that this is not just, you know, another chapter in Jesus' life or the life of the world. Something totally new has happened. The authorship of Matthew's Gospel is unknown. I know that sounds funny because we're saying Matthew. But most do not believe that it was written by Matthew the Apostle. For a couple of reasons. One, because Matthew's Gospel quotes extensively from Mark's account. Again, like I said, he and Luke lifted whole sections from Mark's Gospel and put it into theirs. And so we would have to ask, if he were an eyewitness, why would he rely on a non-eyewitness for all of these stories? Also, it's clear that his Gospel was written later, long after Matthew had died, after the destruction of the Temple in AD 70, for sure. The place, the New American Bible says that there's a plausible suggestion that it was written in Antioch, which was one of the most important um, air regions of the time, cities certainly, um, in Antioch, which is the home of our Ignatius of Antioch, that's why I mentioned that, that's all. Capital of the Roman province of Syria, and it had a large mixed population of Greek-speaking Gentiles and Jews. Just two more quick things. Matthew's Gospel includes the judgment of all nations, which is unique in his Gospels. Remember in Matthew 25, Jesus says the Son of Man will come, he'll be seated on his throne, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them as sheep are separated from the goats. He will say to you, come, enter the kingdom of heaven, for I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty, etc. And again, here's Matthew saying, this is not just a concept, this is not just you know, an academic exercise. You need to learn this to, to um, be obedient like Jesus and to follow him with lives lived, with Christian lives, with lives lived like his in the world. Also, his gospel ends with that great commission, the end of 28. Um, Go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit very much in keeping with what we've already learned about Matthew. He wants us to learn this, to believe it, to accept it, 
and go, go out into the world to teach all nations. There's really a neat thing that I never knew until I read it and studied it and prayed about this, but the gospel ends with the way it begins, fulfilling their promise. At 1.23, chapter 1, verse 23, we're told that, that Jesus' name will be Emmanuel. Remember that? A name which means God is with us. It ends at 28.20 with Jesus saying, I am with you always. Isn't that neat? I love that. Love those little connections. So the angel says his name will be God is with us, and Jesus says, I am with you always until the end of the ages. Love that. Okay. And just a quote from the Bible. His gospel answers the question how obedience to the will of God is to be expressed by those who live after the turn of the ages, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew's Gospel. Now we move on to Mark. Mark was most likely the first Gospel of the four to be written. Many people think it was written about 35 to 40 years after the resurrection, right around the destruction of the temple, around the year AD 70. Mark, like the others, is not but Mark, more than the others, is not really concerned about putting out a biography on Jesus, especially his early years. If he were, you know, we read a biography today, an autobiography, and we expect to hear where they grew up, where did they live, what did they do, what did they like to read, what are their favorite things to do, you know, things like that. Mark especially was not concerned about that. This was one of the first Gospels to be written. He didn't have time to get into that. What did Jesus wear? What did he look like or anything like that? Mark wanted to get the Gospel, the good news, out as fast as possible. So he dives right in with the baptism of Jesus. That's how it starts. The, the, um, I like this, this uh, phrase that the New American Bible says, he gives us a breathless narrative. And if you read the Gospel, and it's the shortest one, or perhaps the easiest, I don't know, the easiest to read, but maybe because it's the shortest, 16 chapters, you'll see. And if you read it, you'll probably be out of breath. It just moves on. Then Jesus did this. The whole crowds came to him. He opened the eyes of this person. Then people reached out to him. He went to pray. They did this. The next morning, they, I mean, you get that sense. You just want to say to Mark, relax, I've got to breathe here. But that was his goal, was to get it out as fast as possible. Jesus, for Mark, of course, is the gospel of God, bringing with him the kingdom of God. Jesus rescues humanity by serving humanity and by sacrificing his life. We see at the beginning, it starts out with Jesus and the devil in the desert, you know, um, uh, arguing, sparring with each other. This serves to set up a major theme in the gospel. Satan will fall, ultimately. The Son of God will be victorious, and so will the disciples once the Holy Spirit comes to them. Mark wrote to non-Jews primarily, so he doesn't explain a lot of the customs and practices like Matthew does. As I said, it is the most simple and basic of all four Gospels, just 16 chapters long. Yet, this is interesting, it often gives more details than the others of some of the things that Jesus said and did. So even though it's the shortest, you know, he, he decides to give a little bit more details than the others did about certain events, certain of the things Jesus did, the sayings or miracles. There's something in Mark, Mark's Gospel that people call the secret, the messianic secret, the secret about the Messiah. And Mark didn't say this, but it looks like as he's writing it, you can tell that as it starts out, and for much of the Gospel, nobody really knew who Jesus was. Not even his closest disciples. And this brought great distress to Jesus, that nobody seemed to know. Oh, someone did know, actually. The devils. When Jesus would exercise someone, remember this, they'd say, I know who you are. You are the Son of God. And he would silence them. He didn't want to be known as an exorcist only or as a miracle worker. He wanted people to come to know him personally, so he wouldn't let the demons just announce who he was. And so, you know, you see this, this secret that, you know, even his disciples, after he does something, they look at each other and they say, who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey. 
Who is this who has such power from God? A breakthrough comes right almost midway point, the exact midway point of the gospel. In chapter 8, Jesus says, Who do people say that I am? And they throw out these things. And finally, who do you say that I am? And it's Peter. God bless Peter who says, You are the Messiah. It's the first time that someone really, really recognizes who he is. And Jesus says, You didn't even, he, he's, you recognize, you didn't do that on your own. My Heavenly Father helped you with that answer. My Heavenly Father is revealing me to you. And then, from there, I mean, there's still confusion. There's still a lot of people who are in the dark, but the word is starting to get up. Okay. It's interesting to know, as well, about Mark's Gospel, that there's no small amount of disagreement over the true end of Mark's Gospel. That may sound strange. You may think, what? I have it right here. What do you mean there's disagreement? But it seems that the ancient, most ancient manuscripts ended rather abruptly with chapter 16, verse 8. When the women go to the tomb, they find it empty, and they're confused. Or it says, fearful. And I think a lot of people, I think the earliest, probably some of the earlier, the earliest Christians, maybe the disciples even of Mark, said, you know, I don't know that we should end. Maybe we shouldn't end with that fear. Even though it's a holy fear, it says the women were fearful. They didn't really know what to do at that point. And so, um, it leads some to think that perhaps the original ending was lost after 6, 8, 16, 8. So, uh, ch chapter 16, verse 8. Some people think that perhaps that last, the, the real ending for Mark was lost. Um, then there are two additional endings that are also found in ancient manuscripts going all the way back. A longer one and a shorter one. We have both of them in the New American Bible and in many, if not all, translations. The longer ending, which goes through chapter 16, has been accepted as canonical by the Council of Trent. So even though scholars are debating which is the original, where is the original, and is it lost? As Roman Catholics, we know the truth. It's the long, it's the full gospel that we have with the longer ending in our Bible. Early church fathers quoted it, so it was probably written by the second century. And this includes in that longer version appearances to Mary Magdalene, the commissioning of the eleven, and the ascension of Jesus. The shorter ending was found after verse 8 in fourth. In four, seventh to ninth century Greek manuscripts. I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff, but it's just interesting. And it's included at the very end of our Bibles. And just to confuse you further, and it, they, you can see this in the New American Bible especially, there's even another couple of verses that are found in the longer ending, which seem to have been known to St. Jerome in the fourth century. And if you want, you can read those at the, in the, probably in the notes section. They're not in the gospel itself. The authorship of Mark's gospel, traditionally it has been ascribed to a person named John Mark, perhaps the person mentioned in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verse 12. It says, Peter went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who is called Mark, where there were many people gathered in prayer. John Mark accompanied his cousin Barnabas and Paul on a missionary journey. He also appears in Paul's letters and with Peter, so he had plenty of time to learn from them about the life of Jesus. From these sources, as well as from other oral and written sources, Mark put together the first gospel, which would be used itself as a source for Matthew and Luke. Okay, Luke's gospel is next. Like Matthew, um, Luke probably, Luke's Gospel was written probably 45 or even 60 years after the resurrection. 80, 95 AD, I'm not sure. Since it was written later, people were now more interested in the life of Jesus. And this makes sense, doesn't it, if you think about it. Mark, remember, wanted to get the news out as fast as possible. Fifteen years later or so, we think the Gospels of Matthew and Luke were written. Now people are beginning to step back just a little, saying, okay, we know he's coming back, maybe it won't be tonight. How do we really incorporate his life 
in our, into our life? How do we incorporate who he was into our way of life? In fact, we want to know more now about Jesus' background, his birth, his upbringing, a little bit. So it's really interesting. It makes sense that the later Gospels have more details. Okay. And so they have those two Gospels to tell us about Jesus' infancy and where he came from. They didn't know much about, you know, exactly how it all went down, if you will. And they weren't really concerned with getting everything exactly correct. They wanted to show, especially symbolically, what the birth of Jesus meant. That's why the accounts of Mark, Matthew, and Luke differ somewhat. The infancy stories are told in light of the resurrection. They needed a, a way to express the specialness, if you will, of Jesus from the beginning. Now, I need to stop for a second and tell you, remind you, I don't need to stop this, I need to stop for a second and tell you that this almost sounds clinical. It almost sounds like, oh, they needed a way to say, to explain the way Jesus was born, so they invented the virgin birth or something like that. Please understand me, I'm not saying that at all. That was revealed by God as truth to them. But, I'm, but, but I mean, the way they brought that into their Gospels, they needed a way to, to really show that Yes, he was like us in all things but sin. But yes, he was also not like us. He was, um, he came from God directly. His conception was, was made possible from God by the Holy Spirit. The Word became flesh. Okay. Just want to make it clear that as we talk about scholars and academics, that we know that this is more than just an academic effort. God is directing, of course, all the, the Gospels, the writing and the reading of the Gospels today. Okay. Luke is, Luke's Gospel is the first of a two-part work of the same author, Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. And it says so at the beginning of each of those books. I quoted them for you in the handout that I realize you don't have at home. But anyway, Luke 1, 1 to 3. This is what Luke says. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided, after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus, who's that? Well, it could have been a person, but the name also means friend of God, Theophilus. And so it's really to all of us that he's writing. I'm right, I, I investigated it, it's been handed down. I give it to you, friend of God, so that you can have the good news as well. And the Acts of the Apostles starts saying, in the first book of Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus did and taught until the day he was taken up, taken up, after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles. So we see it's part one. Part two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perhaps more than any of the other Gospels, Luke shows how the promise of salvation, which was given to the Israelites, is now realized in the Gentiles, or among the Gentiles. Like the other Gospels, Luke shows that God's promises to Israel are fulfilled in Jesus. But unlike the others, perhaps, he's also showing now how it extends out, especially to the Gentiles, who, as we heard, by this time, are accepting it more than the Jews were. Luke is very interested in history, in the history of the secular world and the history of the religious world at the time. So he has a lot of references to the reigning emperor or the governor. You know, when Quirinius was governor, there was a census taken. Or um, when Abiathar was the high priest, he likes to root the gospel in the, the history of the day. He seems to like, about, like to talk about the current ruler and whatever else is going on in his day. So he, and that's really interesting, I think it just, it just shows us that, again, this is not an academic exercise for Luke or for any of the evangelists. This is something real. As John would say later, it's something we have seen, touched, and heard with our ears and we pass it on to you. So that's, that's really neat. And that's why he anchors it in history. And I found this, there's even a little bit of swagger to what Luke says. Swagger, that word is not found in the Bible, I'm sure. But nonetheless, that's my word. 
he, he's, he's so sure of the gospel that he says in the Acts of the Apostles 26, 26, chapter 26, verse 26, when he's speaking to the king, I speak boldly, for none of this was done in a corner. I love that. He said, he, he's basically saying, look, it's here. This, this happened. You need to know this. For your own good, you need to believe and accept it and live it. This isn't a secret. It was done openly. And I speak boldly to you. I love that about Luke. This gospel seems to be concerned a little bit more with the here and now, as opposed to only looking at the second coming, the last day. By looking at both Luke and Acts together, we can see Luke's emphasis on implementing Jesus' teaching every day among the early Christian community. Remember, this was written later, so people were now starting to think about the long term. In the beginning, they were sure he was going to come right down on that cloud. That you remember, they were just kind of waiting, waiting. It's going to be tonight. He's coming. You know, it's been 2,000 years, but as time went on, especially a couple of decades, they thought, okay, maybe it's not going to be tonight. I hope it is, but maybe not. Let's start planning for the long term. And so we see Luke inserting unique, this unique phrase or concept like each day or daily into his gospel and saying to Jesus, like this, take up your cross daily and follow me. Give us this day our daily bread. Or, Jesus was teaching in the temple area every day. So again, the, the urgency is still there to believe and to wait for the second coming, but he's saying, look, we need to live this every day. Take up your cross every day, not just once. Pray for the strength you need for your daily bread every day. The New American Bible says, although Luke still believes, of course, the parousia, that is the second coming, to be a reality that will come unexpectedly, he is more concerned with presenting the words and deeds of Jesus as guides for the conduct of Christian disciples in the interim period between the ascension and the second coming, and with presenting Jesus himself as the model of Christian life and piety. A couple more things about Luke. He has a special concern for the forgotten and the overlooked, the poor, the sinners, the outcasts, the sick, the afflicted. Perhaps more direct, he's more direct than the others in taking on the comfortable and the wealthy. Whereas in Matthew, the Beatitudes have Jesus saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. Luke says simply, Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who hunger. Of course, he meant the righteousness and the poor in spirit, but he also meant, really, Blessed are the poor, the analim, as it says, that's a great word from the Old Testament, the outcast, the truly, physically, materially poor. As well, Matthew's Beatitudes, as you know, go on to have to include four woes. Woe to you who are rich now. Woe to you who are comfortable now. Luke, it seems, was not afraid to take on the comfortable and the wealthy. Okay. Mm -hmm. The author traditionally was ascribed to, this is no surprise, a person named Luke, a Syrian from Antioch, mentioned in Paul's letters to the Colossians, Philemon, and Timothy. Even the beginning part of the Gospels show that Luke not a first-generation Christian. As I read to you, he said, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning handed them down to us. So he admits he was not one of the first um, disciples or eyewitnesses. He's passing along what was handed down to him from eyewitnesses themselves. Luke, just like Matthew, as I said again, took a lot of Mark's Gospel. I mean, Again, it, they would have been arrested today probably for plagiarism, but they just took, no, not really. Okay. But they took whole parts of the gospel and just inserted it. You know, I think they probably figured, you know, why should we repeat it? I mean, it's gospel, it's the truth. Let's just, I mean, why should we, you know, kind of, um, why should we have to add our own things? Well enough state, so they did that. As well, Luke and Matthew seem to share another source because they have stories not in that Mark's Gospel, but stories that are exactly the same, word for word. So many scholars think that they had two major sources, Mark's Gospel and this other Gospel, 
If you want to know, it's, they call it Q, which is uh, from, uh, it means source in what language, Bill? Well, is that Greek? I don't know. German. If you're at home, German? German, thank you. Okay, fine. But anyway, so they had marked in this Q source, and they took a lot of it and, and put it into their own Gospels. Okay. And this one also ends as it begins. Remember, Matthew's Gospel ends with, I mean, begins with, his name is God with us, and ends with, I am with you always. Luke's Gospel begins in the temple with Zechariah, the high priest, or the priest, and then it ends with the disciples who are in the temple area every day, praising God. So it's, I love that too. Another one, begin and sing. Okay, great. We're moving on to John. John is the most unique of all four Gospels. It's probably the latest of all to be written, and so it reflects more theology, more symbolic language. Now they have time to step back and put it in a different light, you know, with more theology and symbolism. The prologue to John's Gospel is perhaps its greatest treasure. You know this well, I think. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later, the Word became flesh. It sets the whole tone of the Gospel in sweeping, cosmic terms. It describes Jesus as the pre-existent one, which was alluded to in wisdom literature. Remember when we talked about wisdom? Especially chapter 8 talks about how wisdom was with God in the beginning. She was with God, she delighted with God, etc. Jesus is, Jesus is the personified wisdom, the pre-existent one. Who would else, who else would dare begin anything, much, I mean, much more a gospel, with the same words that the Bible begins with, the Bible of their day, the Pentateuch, in the beginning. He begins with the exact same words. I mean, it's just cosmic. He wants to say, just like Matthew, something totally different now has happened. And whereas the others start with Jesus on earth, being born or being baptized, John starts in the, in the heavens. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. That's why, if you, you probably know that the four Gospels are symbolized, are given symbols. Um, I'm sorry, I'm confusing you. This was for later, but... Um, traditionally, there are four, the Gospels are given four symbols. An ox, a lion, a human being, and an eagle. Where does that come from? From Revelation, who says that these four creatures are around the throne. And so, the earliest Christians ascribe different Gospels to these things, and to these different ones. Just to let you know, Mark is the lion, Luke is the calf or the ox, Matthew is the human being, and John, of course, is the eagle soaring over everything else because his theology is so high, if you will. I can go over that later, but I'm going to move on. Okay, great. Um, where is the other story? Okay, great. The, the Gospel of John, interestingly enough, doesn't, have, doesn't show Jesus being baptized, although it does have him going to see John, and John points to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. John is, this is my term, I'm pretty sure I've heard this from my scholars, um, from my scholars, I'm sorry, from my professors, um, when I was in school, if not, I'm making this up, it's my own first original thought. John is like a lawyer who's trying to present his case so that one may hear or read and believe. Look at the end of chapter 20, which might have been the original ending of John's Gospel. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Thus John presents seven major signs, if you will, miracles mostly, that are proofs of Jesus' authority and power. He sets it up like that, and so his gospel is like presenting these signs, one after the other, from, from the wedding of Cana, through the walking on water, through the paralytic, the multiplication of the loaves and fish, to the healing of the man born blind, and finally to the climactic 
magic sign, the greatest one, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Each of these shows something unique about Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy or his mastery over the forces of nature. As well, they are physical signs, expressions of what Jesus came to do. He came to set us free from our captivity. He came to feed us with his body and blood. He came to open our eyes and to give us a share in his resurrection. Like with Mark, there are some questions regarding the true ending of the Gospel of John. Some manuscripts end with chapter 20. Others include one more chapter, which is very similar in style to the rest of the Gospel. But it seems clear to many theologians that it's the result of some editing and extra material who are familiar from people of John's time who are familiar with his style. Much material about Jesus, there's much material in Jesus, in, I'm sorry, about Jesus in John that is not found in the other Gospels. For instance, we learn in John that Jesus baptized, we don't see that in the others, that he preached and ministered for years, and that he traveled to Jerusalem repeatedly for Jewish festivals, and that he was put to death the day before Passover. John really wants us to know that. Many people think that John wrote his gospel partially to counter claims that Jesus was not the Messiah. There were some, for instance, in, in John's community to which he was writing, who thought that John the Baptist was the prophet to be followed, not Jesus. With signs and miracles, John hopes to show that Jesus is not only more important than John, he is, quite frankly, God made flesh. There is no one better than he, of course. In addition, John shows that there was great opposition to Jesus, of course, especially from the leaders of his day, whom he just called, kind of lumped them all together, and called them the Jews, which is really unfortunate, and in Vatican, the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, kind of stepped back from that and said, you know, we don't blame the Jews, we shouldn't just say that, it's, it's the Jews who killed Jesus. We are the ones who did it. And so instead of just saying the Jews all the time, we need to remember that it refers to the leadership, some of the leadership among the Jews. It's an important thing to know as you read John. But it's interesting because John wants to set this up so much, you know, just like the lawyer who wants to tell you, not only am I right, but they're wrong. He says that those who oppose Jesus sometimes, he, he accuses them of being children of the devil. He's not just saying you're wrong, you don't have this quite right. He's saying you're children of Satan, actually. So it's really interesting. You feel very passionate. Like Luke, John shows that, that women can be just as faithful as men in the role of disciple, if not more so. The encounter with the woman at the well embodies what a missionary should be. Remember, after having that encounter with Jesus, she goes into the village and says, Come. Meet a man who has told me everything I have ever done. And the whole village or the whole town believed because of her word. That she is the epitome or the example of what missionaries should be. As well, it's clear in his gospel as in the other, as in the others, that Mary Magdalene was the first witness to the resurrection and the first apostle or the first one to announce the good news of the resurrection. The ending of John's Gospel has some really neat and unique stories as well. At breakfast on the shore, when Jesus tells them to cast their net, bring the fish in, and he cooks them breakfast, if you will. Um, when Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It gives us, um, as well, this curious exchange between Peter and Jesus regarding the beloved disciple. I'll leave that up to you to read and to just think about, but it's interesting because Peter says to Jesus, well, what about him? Pointing to the other disciple, which is probably John. And Jesus says, what about him? What if I want him to remain on earth until I come again? It doesn't matter. You go and preach the good news. John basically wants to end it by saying, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the world. You could worry about everyone else, but it doesn't matter. You've learned now. Go preach the good news. Then we get that last sentence in chapter 21. This. There are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. I love this. And I think this is also very important for us Catholics 
because there are, as we studied before, many people who say that if it's not in Scripture, it didn't happen or it's not to be followed. But here is John saying he did so much, many more things that are not found in Scripture. And these are revealed to us later, we believe. These are revealed, these truths that happened then were revealed, such as the virgin birth, the, um, uh, the assumption of Mary, the immaculate conception, etc. So anyway, it's just kind of an interesting thing. He says it's not all written here. He did a lot more than what was written. Okay, finally, the Acts of the Apostles. This is, as I said, part two of Luke's Gospel. It shows how the Christians responded to the Christ event. By the Christ event, I mean um, the incarnation, the teaching, passion, the death, and resurrection of Jesus. All one thing, if you will, as though it could all be like summarized. But anyway, and how they were led by the Holy Spirit to live the good news. It shows continuity between the historical mission of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles in Luke. And this is Luke's way of guaranteeing the fidelity of the church's teaching to the teaching of Jesus. He shows that it just continued. Jesus was taken up, the Holy Spirit came to them, they did the same exact things as Jesus, sometimes using the same exact words as he did. It is invaluable. The Acts of the Apostles for us also shows the primacy of Peter. And I, I didn't really focus on this until just recently. I gave a talk on the magisterium and the papacy, and, and I just looked in the Acts of the Apostles. It's amazing how often we see that the other disciples looked to Peter for an answer, or Peter presided over the Christian of the church. Peter made a decision, etc. Really interesting. Right after the ascension, Peter says, we need a replacement for Judas, or one of his followers has taken his life. We need, we need another replacement. And they have a little uh, uh, way to find a new re a replacement, if you will, and an apostle Barnabas. Peter presides over that. After they receive the Holy Spirit, they go out into the town and they start to preach the good news, remember? And Peter stands up and says, citizens of the world know this, these men are not drunk, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter makes the first infallible statement, the first papal pronouncement. My terms, nobody else's. This may be my second original saying ever, but this is, it's the first time that the truth has been declared by one of the disciples publicly and infallibly. He says to them, let it be known that this Jesus whom you crucified is Lord and Savior. A dogma, an absolute truth of the church, pronounced by the first pope, St. Peter. Peter speaks for the apostles at the Council of Jerusalem. He presided over that. He presides over the church. He is a miracle worker like Jesus. He is the object of divine care. Remember when he's in jail a couple times, the chains just miraculously fall off of him. And that he is the spokesman for the Christian community. Acts of the Apostles also introduces Paul to us and tells his story of conversion, which is confirmed in his own letters later on. Paul's arrests, travels, and impending martyrdom show the potential fate of all who follow Jesus. As well, Paul's focus on the kingdom of heaven is a lesson to us all. After our life on earth, lived with the Lord, we too can hope to reign with him forever in heaven. The Acts of the Apostles shows how the Christian community, rooted in Judaism, took the news of the resurrection and formed a new community that grew and spread so that it encompassed many cultures and many nations, becoming, in effect, a worldwide religion. Thus, it is significant that it ends with Paul's travels to Rome. Paul was arrested. Paul said, I'm a citizen. When he was arrested, he appealed to Caesar. He said, I'm a citizen of Rome. I have the right to do this, knowing full well probably that they would take him all the way to Rome and where he spent his last couple of years in prison or in house arrest teaching people about Jesus. Why is that significant? Because Rome was the capital of the civilized world. That was the end of the world basically for them. Why is that significant? Because Jesus said, go and preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Acts of the Apostles ends with Paul in Rome, the capital of the civilized world. In effect, 
taking it to the ends of the earth. Isn't that great? Man, I love this stuff. Okay, just two more quick things. At first, it was mostly Jewish Christians, as we said, who accepted the word, then some Gentiles, then mostly Gentiles. Again, it shows the universal reign of God and the opening of salvation that promised to all people. Acts of the Apostles portrays the community as being guided by the Holy Spirit, the advocate promised in the Gospel, who would lead them to all truth. Through the Spirit, Jesus is alive and present in the community then, just as he is for us today.